consideration of the order of the
Hi, everyone. If we can all just take our seats, we're going to begin in a minute. Welcome everyone um, to a really beautiful night um, here in Tucson, Arizona. I'm Diana Marie Delgado. I'm the literary director of the Poetry Center. And I'm beyond ecstatic today to be here with you to celebrate the poetry of Mark Doty. Let's hear it for Mark. Mark is here as part of our annual Tom Sanders Memorial Reading, uh, which features writers who are of importance to the University of Arizona. And Mark attended the University of Arizona, and he also spent a lot of time here. Uh, he and I were just sort of chatting earlier a little bit about time that he had spent here locally and how much Tucson has changed. So he can definitely talk more about that. But. Um, he really loves it here, and we're so glad that he's made time to just be with us, to share his words. Um, Mark, I think, has over 15, 16 books. He actually lost count. He's like, give or take 10. Um, so it's just, it's such an honor to be here tonight, just to celebrate him and all the other poets that we bring throughout the year. Um, I'll be sharing more announcements of what we have in store for the spring, of our classes, um, our readers that will be coming. And I just also want to remind you that Mark will stick around after the reading to sign books. So don't miss that opportunity. Um, the Poetry Center uh, has been impacted by the losses of some key advocates to our center, and I just want to note the passing of Helen Schaefer, whose life will be celebrated here at the Poetry Center this Saturday from 3 to 5 in the Brisway. Everyone is welcome. It will also be live streamed, um, so if you can't make it, um, you don't have to be here in person, but you could also sort of celebrate um, their importance to the Poetry Center. Um, there's also the recent passing of R Richard Shelton. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that without advocates, um, the Poetry Center wouldn't exist. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I will be inviting now Ellison Deming, um, who will say a few words about Richard Shelton and who will also be here to introduce Mark. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I'm sure we'll, down the road, have a public event for Dick where many words will be said. Many of you knew him. Um, we would not have a poetry center if we had not had Richard Shelton's devotion to the literary arts and the possibility of building community around poetry. We would not have our distinguished MFA program without Richard Shelton. I would not have had 32 years of a great friendship with a man who took me on hikes uh, and uh, led me to encounter Gila monsters and rattlesnakes and ghost towns uh, in southern Arizona. So um, I, I just would like to have us, um, of course, have a moment of silence and remember uh, that he was a, a great human who gave so much to our community, to students. He saved lives in the prison. He went as long as he could stand up to work in the prison with men. He believed that poetry could help redeem lives that felt that they were over. And he uh, was a deeply generous man. And we will grieve his loss for a long time. So let's just take a minute to think about Richard Shelton. Okay, 
it is a joy to welcome Mark Doty back to what may be a place of origin for him. Tyler got a note today from the poet Brenda Hillman in response to the news of Dick's death in which she wrote of Shelton. He was so important to my idea of what a real poet was when I was first getting serious. In high school at Rincon with Mark Doty. <laughs> I thought of the Sheltons and the Poetry Center as this mythical land downtown where poets walked around having deep thoughts and contacting the unknown. <laughs> so, here we are with Mark Doty, having come very far from Rincon High School, to join us here tonight. He's the author of nine books of poetry, including Deep Lane, Fire to Fire, New and Selected Poems, which won the 2008 National Book Award, and My Alexandria, winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the T.S. Eliot Prize in the UK. Of that book, Philip Levine wrote, if it were mine to invent the poet to complete the century of William Carlos Williams and Wallace Stevens, I would create Mark Doty, just as he is, a maker of big, risky, fearless poems in which ordinary human experience becomes music." End quote. It was a book that carried the heavy freight of the early AIDS epidemic and helped give many readers a place of community to grieve and find solidarity. As the title, My Alexandria, attests, owning the pain and ruin of that time was perhaps the only path to transcending it. In his most recent poetry collection, Deep Lane, whether writing about crystal meth, a lover, a partner, a laundromat on 16th Street, radishes, or daily ruminative walks along Deep Lane, or playing ball with his dog Ned, the intensity of his passion to see and say things true, to savor the particularities, both beauties and brutalities of the day, abides. His poems are driven by desire and a fierce love of the world. He's often spoken of as a rhapsodic poet or ecstatic, no, not ecstatic, which suggests out-of-body experience. No poet I can think of is more rooted in the desiring body, in the suffering and joy of queerness, in the capacity to chronicle in song his being wounded and self-wounding, with such intimacy. Now, I'd say a poet of radical illumination, borrowing a phrase Doty applies to Whitman. There's a particularly tender poem in Deep Lane about a visit to a barber shop. This is your home now, the barber says. And with the laying on of the barber's hands, the poet writes, we go down in the trance of touch and skull buzz drone singing cranial news in the singing cranial nerves in the direction of peace. Doty's also the author of six prose poems, most recently, What is Grass, Walt Whitman, In My Life, in, what, in which he marries the particularity of Whitman's poems, I'm sorry, in particularities of Whitman's work and life with his own, and what kindred they are. Doty writes of Whitman's poems what one might easily write about Doty's. They find the basis for a social compact in the common bedrock of the desiring body. He, founds, he finds downright erotic engagement with Leaves of Grass, and when he handles an original text at the Library of Congress, touches the pages that Whitman touched, he feels close to the hands of a man I love. It is a glorious book in hybrid form, seamlessly weaving memoir with criticism, a sustained exercise in close and soulful reading. I team it up with George Saunders, A Swim in the Pond in the Rain, which performs a similar task with Russian works of short, short fiction as two brilliant books that teach us how to slow down and read. I've known Mark for over 40 years. He was my thesis advisor for my MFA at Vermont College in 1982, or three. Back then, I used a typewriter, and he sent me these beautiful handwritten commentaries on my poems, 
and I do have his permission. He has no idea what I'm going to read. But um, this, to make note that we are always who we are, and he was who he was in 1982. I'm just going to read you a short excerpt from his letter. Uh, and, and I don't know what the question is to which he refers, but that doesn't matter. My favorite of the questions, and certainly the toughest, I recognize your rhetorical intentions, but since I share a similar obsession, I'll play about a bit with an answer. First of all, I think many sensitive folks recognize early in life, like as very young children, the particular power of sexual feeling as the force and potentiality which somehow transcends the limitations of their surroundings and as a force potential power which their parents and others around them aren't really dealing with or are denying. Perhaps sex then seems the growing edge, the uncontrollable, thank goodness, urge that might take us beyond the limitations of the unsatisfactory world we see around us, not subject to rationality, not able to be placed in the next in the neat rows of the classroom. Sex at early ages is perhaps seen as the body's secret flowering and potentiality, the physical incarnation of magic. Then he goes on and just to, to wax literary, you know, Edmund White, Freud, uh, James Schuyler, and James Merrill. <laughs> anyway, anyway, <laughs> sex is a kind of model of the artist's way of life, a way of knowing the world by heart and by touch. Touch and physical pleasure is finally simply not translatable into words. It remains ineffable, new, a wellspring of energy that language cannot exhaust. The I encounters the other, which is both like and unlike self. The encounter produces a spiritual spark or fire which expresses itself through certain received codes of sexual behavior. Isn't that a duplicate, in a way, of the artistic process? Was I ever lucky to have him for a teacher? <laughs> well, this is your home too, Mark. We love you and uh, are very happy to welcome you back to Tucson. Please welcome Mark Doty. So the characteristic that all great introductions have in common is that they are almost completely disabling. Yeah, I mean, you know, somebody says about you the things that you would most love to hear and you're actually alive to hear them, you know, so, yeah, yeah. Tucson for me, every time I come to Tucson, is a place of reconnection, of circling back and that circle then moving on forward. Allison, as she told you, was my student in 1982. Diana was my student at Columbia University in the grad program there in 96. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and so many friends here, so many wonderful writers, wonderful readers. I want to tell you a little story because of the particular circumstances of this evening's reading. In was, let's see, I was at Rincon High School in either 1968 or 1969. Uh, my drama teacher gave us an assignment to memorize something we had written and to perform it for the class, and I did uh, memorize a couple of poems I had written, and he, my drama teacher, Mr. Frakes, who I love dearly, said, uh, well, it's supposed to be something you wrote. I said, well, I did, I did, and he didn't entirely believe me. Now, these weren't great poems by any means, but they were sort of precocious, and there was probably not, not too many young, not too many students at Rincon were reading surrealist poetry and Pablo Neruda and Blake, uh, but they were in there in the poems. So in order to catch me out, Jack took my poems to Richard Shelton, who was his friend. So I made my, my way down to the Poetry Center, the old one on Speedway, the little adobe, and um, there at the door was Dick in his coppery ringlets and I think a pair of leather trousers, and, and a, magnetically welcoming. And he gave me a few suggestions about what to read and what would improve my poems. But what he did that was extraordinary was that he presented to me the figure of the poet, the first adult I'd ever met 
who centered his life around the practice of an art, and that art for him meant everything. He talked about poets of the present and of the past, no matter how distant the past is, if he knew them, he had stories about everybody. He quoted reams of poems. He seemed to breathe poetry. He said that anytime I wanted to, I could come down to the Poetry Center and I could hang out and read, I could come to readings, I could have conferences with visiting poets. Shortly thereafter, I found myself hiding behind a tree looking at James Tate, uh, uh, carefully avoiding Philip Levine because I was terrified of these people, I was so shy of them, and they seemed to me to walk above the ground. I felt that Shelton held open a door for me that day. He said, here is a community that you are welcome to join if you would like to come in. And I did, and I never looked back. The point of this story is that in a way, simply that culture is not something that takes care of and perpetuates itself. If we want people to love this art, we give it to them, we invite them in. If we want people to share values that we have, we have to demonstrate the ways in which those values change our lives and matter. Dick did that for me as probably, well, he did it first, let's put it that way. He was for me a shining beacon of possibility. And there's so many people gathered around this place who also serve as examples of what we can do together. It's thrilling, thank you. So I'm gonna read you some new poems. Uh, I might read one from a previous collection, but I've been working on this new book that's um, actually about my neighborhood in New York City. And, um, you know, if you're going to choose a microcosm, that's a pretty interesting one to look at to see what it might reveal. When I started writing these poems, I didn't know that's what I was doing. Um, and this one sort of opened the door. It's about a dog named George who, hmm, figured how to do this without making a spell. George entered my life as part of a new relationship and left when that relationship ended. The uh, first, the title of the poem is the beginning of the first line. It simply flows right in. It's called Little George. And I have to figure out the right distance for this. Little George looks, <laughs> little George barks at whatever is not the world as he pretends to know it. Trash sacks, hand trucks, black hats, canes and hoods, shovels, someone smoking a joint beneath the Haitian evangelicals overhang, anyone, how dare they, walking a dog. George barks, the tense white comma of himself arced in alarm. At home, he floats in the creaturely domestic, curled in the warm triangle behind a sleeper's knees, wiggling on his back on a sofa, all jelly in size, requesting, receiving a belly rub. No worries. But outside the apartment's metal door, the unmanageable day assumes its blurred and infinite disguises. Best to bark. No matter that he's slightly larger than a toaster. He proceeds as if he rules a rectangle two blocks deep, bounded west and east by 7th Avenue and Union Square. Whatever's there is there by his consent. And subject to the rebuke of his refusal, though when he asserts his will, he trembles. If only he were not solely responsible for raising outcry at any premonition of trouble on West 16th Street. And right out on the pavement might lay down the clanking armor of his bluster. Some evening when he's climbed the stairs after our last walk and winds the round, and rounds the landing turn and turns his way toward his steady sleep, I wish he might be visited by a dream of the world as kind. How any looming unreadable might turn out to hold the April green of an unsullied tennis ball. Dear one, surely the future is not entirely out to get us. And if it is, barking won't help much. But no such luck, not yet. He takes umbrage this morning at a stone image serene in a neighbor's garden and stiffens and, and fixes and sounds his wild alarm. Damn you, Buddha, get out of here, go away. I read that poem um, a summer ago at, in London at the London Buddhist Institute uh, and had forgotten that I was standing next to a nine foot golden Buddha. Happily, the Buddhists were very tolerant of this. So, You'll notice there's a mention in that poem of the stairs, and although this was not planned, the stairs in this apartment building seem to show up in every single one of these poems in some way, so you might enjoy tracking that. My building is a co-op, a peculiar form of urban real estate in which um, 
people at some point band together and buy an apartment building and then sell shares in it rather than the real estate itself. And co-ops are notorious for co-op boards and co-op presidents, which can be testy. <laughs> this is called Ghost Story, West 16th. Pam lived 40 years in apartment one and ran our co-op with an iron hand. She ruled by simply keeping needed information to herself. <laughs> Two doors open from her place into the hall. If I came down late the year the buzzer didn't work to greet some man I'd soon come to know or fumbled hopeless with my keys at 4 a.m., I felt her eye fixed behind a peephole that bent the hallway light around me to a ring of, not shame exactly, but a stubborn residual embarrassment. Two months dead, she seems to hover at that door still, vigilant, disapproving, not on moral grounds, but because you never know. Secretary for our meetings, I duly noted what she, when she announced, if you're having a visitor at night, well, lucky for you, but be sure to escort him to the door. Abrasive, she hated conflict. If anyone stood up to her, she'd cry. She earned her MSW at Hunter years before, and afternoons saw clients in her dim, cat-shadowed parlor beneath an, uh, beside an untouched upright so heavy the floor beneath it sank. Sometimes I'd see her ushering patients out beaming at each, a benevolence so at odds with how I knew her, it made me dizzy. After surgery, leaning one, light, leaning one night against the stairs she hadn't climbed in years, she reached to touch me through the balustrade and said, I am utterly tired of life. Her daughter, a professor in a distant state, had four decades of her mother's things hauled away, feckless piano among them, and accepted an offer, a million and a half in cash. A floor through, after all, with an airless private garden in the back. The renovation's nearly done. I took a tour, and here's what startled me. That rueful, hectoring, sarcastic spirit presided still. For this money, she thought, it ought to be beautiful, modern, nothing for ghosts to catch on. It's hard enough to leave. Don't you know by now I loved you all? I am now going to admit an embarrassing thing, which was that I left my glasses in the apartment, and I will be a much more comfortable reader if I have my glasses. So if you will just take a breath, talk among yourselves for a moment, I will be right back. Mm
Okay. Much, much better. Now, can we bring the mic up a little? Is that better? Okay, in the back, you all right? If you can't hear me, wave at me, okay? And I will get louder. Is it too loud? Is it echoing? No, okay, okay. All right, so, you've now met George, you met Pam, now you're gonna meet Brian. Upstairs neighbor. Brian. Mornings, he dipped down five flights, dressed for an office vanished 30 years ago. Fedora, houndstooth jacket, seething fumes, alcohol burnished by archaic smokes, Territons, Paul Malls, something I didn't think they made anymore. He still auditioned, never got a part, got by on what? Circumspect, only a little confiding, now and then a girlish flash of camp when he figured no one overheard. A little gossip, the neighbors, the dragon lady downstairs who terrified him. Then, hey-ho, a bit of whistle tune and he'd be off. Returning early evening, he'd sit on the stairs, going either way, he'd say, and if I passed him going either way, he'd say, I'm waiting for my breath to come back from wherever it's gone. I saw his exhalation in the form of a shadow, a phantom silhouette from some old movie slipped down the stairs in search of a city no longer in evidence. So the shadow came home, always, and Brian would resume his climb, cough echoing down to my apartment door, climb to his two fifth floor rooms, to distillates the same amber as his clothes, and the solace of memory breathed out onto discs of black vinyl, hundreds of them, his record collection. The skylark trills of Artie Shaw, the wry and wounded eros of Lady Day, his balm and oxygen. Those stairs. Those stairs were a particular vexation to Ned, my golden retriever. This is from late in Ned's life. It's called Stairs and Days. Ned lifts one broad, blonde paw onto the next step up and when it slides to the right, pulls it back in toward his body and pushes from below. Then the left one follows, he pushes again, and now he's hauled his bulk up one step. Three flights, he's nearly 12, and huffs and focuses and steams his way up the first, negotiates the shorter second set, but then confronts the longest, a curving stair that spills him out into the hall before our apartment door. I praise his stamina, his determination, his fine dangling tongue. He makes just one demand, these mornings and evening salvos up the stairs. If I walk too quickly and pause a few risers above him, he goes no further. He waits till I climb back down to him. He's made it clear. We go side by side or he will not go at all. In this way, he proposes, we will enter into the future. Sometimes I stall as if a cold plunge opened before us and the next step gave way to a wrong end of the telescope view of a vertical stack of days to come in this crooked old building, its crooked hallway emptied of a presence who would continue on these stairs with me if he could, though I know how gladly he will be rid of them. Then he puts one thick blonde paw on the tread immediately above us and waits for me to do the same. So the thing you want to know about, you know, when a poet reads new poems, it means if you ever should see them again, they may be different. You know, who, who knows? You may not recognize them, right? But here they are, you get them in their, not quite raw state, but they're on the way to cooked state. Imperative. He's my age, the man leaning dark against his storefront window ledge, hair and beard dusted white, face impressed with a frazzled net of lines. He doesn't attempt to please or seem in need, but practices all day a toneless, steady neutrality, repeating his monosyllabic plea, change. In this way, he resembles a prisoner who's learned to show almost no deference to his guards, nothing of abasement. He's a barely rippling tank of dark water, superbly contained. He submits to a precise degree he's had years to gauge. Change, he says, all day, fixed in his spot on seventh, the word a key he tries again, hoping this time the tumblers turn. His voice at night more driven, change, as if he meant to chip away at something. The word falling hard on the sidewalk's flint and shadow, ringing on the pavement like a dime.
So not so long ago, I lost my keys. And you know, when you live in a, city, a huge city, this is a crisis of, of rather enormous proportions, in part because one wants in the city to get inside, to, have, to no longer have an inside to get to is a really traumatic thing. You have only the outside world, which is too much. And keys lost in the city are gone. That's it, with very few exceptions. This is called No Orpheus. Dropped in a midnight taxi's back seat dark, slipped through that coat pocket hole you'd always meant to mend, tumbled down a street, cord, street corner drain into an underworld where no Orpheus may ever find an exit, lose your keys here and face the sheer unyielding wall of irretrievable, what won't be found again. 400 years in New York City, how many keys gone head over teeth into the invisible's huge pockets? Whole bronze reefs, tips and ridges gleaming in the murk, Atlantean, these brassy, useless shoals, the rooms they opened immaterial now. Doors that swing on no hinges, open to no one's touch, not even a poet stumbling back from Shadowland. Keys, more of them every blessed night and day, once and always gone. No poetry in that, he thinks, or else there's nothing else. So that's a poem about what one might do with the inevitable losses, make poems out of them, make some kind of art or artifact out of them. This is also a poem that considers a way to think about loss. And it is called House of Beauty. One morning, uh, a few years back, I was driving in Jersey City on the way somewhere, winter morning, and I came across a beauty parlor that had recently been set afire. And I knew this because there was a hole in the window, there were a few little flames licking out. You could hear in the distance the fire engine and siren, so you know, somebody would call them, they were coming, what could you do? I kept on driving, but I could not forget about it. So pretty soon, a line got in my head about it. And I began to think about the, the nursery rhyme, The House That Jack Built, and the form of that amazing rhyme, which uh, every stanza ends with the same line or a version of it, and each one is one line longer than the one before. So hopefully you can sort of hear this stack up. It's called House of Beauty, Theory of Beauty, rather. Sorry. No. Wrong page. House of Beauty. In Jersey City, on Tonelli Avenue, the House of Beauty is burning. On a Sunday morning in January, under the chilly shadow of the Pulaski Skyway, the House of Beauty is burning. Who lobbed the fire bottle through the glass, in among the creams and thrones, the helmets and clippers and combs? Who set the House of Beauty burning? In the dark recess beside the sink, where heads lay back to be laved under the perfected heads rode along the walls, the hopeful photographs of possibility darken, now that the house of beauty is burning. The skyway beetles in the ringing cold, trestle arcing the steel river and warehouses, truck lots and Indian groceries, a new plume of smoke joining the others, billow of dark thought rising from the broken forehead of the house of beauty. An emission almost too small to notice just now. Alarms still ringing, the flames new launched on their project of ruining an effort at pleasure. Glass jutting like cracked ice in the window frame. No one inside, the fire department on the way. All things by nature, wrote Virgil, are ready to get worse. No surprise then that the house of beauty is burning. So whatever happens, however far these fires proceed, reducing history to powder, Whatever the house of beauty made is untouchable now. Nothing can undo so many heads made lovely or at least acceptable. So much shapelessness given what are called permanence, though nothing holds a fixed form. Bring on the flames. What does it matter if the house is burning? Propose a new beauty, perennially unhoused. Neither the lost things nor the fire itself, but the objects in their dresses of disaster. Anything clothed in its own passage. Padded vinyl chair burst into smoky tongues. Lucite helmet sagged to a new version of its flame. 
our black bridge, a charred rainbow on iron legs, two ruby eyes glowering from its crown. If beauty is burning, what could you save? The house of beauty is a house of flames. So um, this is the, this reading's moment of maximum risk. Um, this poem is about a week old, um, which means if you see it again, it will definitely uh, be a little, be somewhat different, but I think it's ready enough to read. Um, and it, it begins with thinking about those extraordinary photographs that have been sent back to us from the new telescopes that show us realms so far away, so impossibly incredibly far away from us, and such harmony, such order and beauty among them. It's called Diamond Planet. It also, um, it's partly concerned with that, also partly you will find its gestation is on the New York subway. Um, Rilke once said if he were locked in a prison cell, he would still be able to write because he would have his childhood. As long as I have the subway, I will be writing poems because it's a perennial source of disruption, entertainment, marvel. Diamond Planet. Those gorgeous photos the new telescope sends back feel consoling now. Grand processes happening without us on the edge of this era and every other. Their beauty inextricable from how long ago, how impossibly far away. Which may be why the stark announcement on the wheeled, lit up signboard parked by my corner market rankles so. The nearest galaxy like ours is 15 million light years away. A sudden window opened on a vastness we won't ever cross. Which may be why a guy on the A train, who's either off his meds or fueled to liquid oblivion, is pounding on a poem framed under acrylic on the car's metal wall. Nearly wailing on it, backing up then hurling himself forward, forearms and fists smashed against the text over and over while he moans with such abandon we've seated him half the car. Can the poem be that bad? <laughs> Maybe knowing it's 15 million years at light speed before you're any place remotely like home makes a poem seem worse. I don't dare get close enough to read it, but I admit I'm starting to hate it too for what it probably doesn't do. We're just trying to hold the morning a little steady here, get ourselves to work almost on time, and somebody writes a poem that doesn't make the distance between a stanza and the stars feel one bit smaller. And somebody else has the nerve to publish it on the train, for God's sake, where you can't help but read it. Even if it isn't brave or reckless enough to take up the task of naming our situation, won't even try to make us feel more legible or say why we feel we all feel so singular and discontent. Probably the poem I'm afraid to approach doesn't do that. But we don't need this maniac pointing that out or beating the poor thing to pulp and shatter. I can't write that desolate poem either. And if I could, who'd want to read it on a train surrounded by strangers? I want to tell you, I want to tell you what I've learned looking at photos of ancient starlight. What reconfigured the night for me? A sign to trace the source of a signal from far out. A steady pulse going erratic in brief pattern beats. Intentional, perhaps? A code? A new telescope found the flicker was interrupted starlight, blinking at an immense dark planet orbited the star. A planet entirely composed of carbon under tremendous pressure, since that planet was huge and near its star. And what happens to pressurized carbon? One vast diamond, surface blackened by debris from the winds of space, but beneath the dust a nearly unthinkable clarity, shot through with those flaws and stresses that write any gleam more visible. A grand poem containing and increasing the light of its star. So near. Imagine when it turns on its axis and the continuous sudden filaments of caught starlight fire every line, vaulting that seeming endless. It doesn't matter how far away it is or that none of us will ever see it. None of us ever go there, ever see inside, much less read it to the end should it have one. Intact, something close enough to forever, not ours. And if it signals, it's only to tell us or anyone it is there. It is so. Thank you. Um, so I, I forgot to tell you there are two stolen lines or quoted lines in that poem. You may have recognized some of them. Uh, we all feel, of course, Elizabeth Bishop from the Moose, when people are stuck, drawn by that creature, stuck, drawn by the creature outside on the highway, 
and the other is, it is there, it is so, the final line is from Hayden Carruth. So how are we doing on time here? Okay. Okay. So we have one little bit longer, one little, one short, quite short. Okay, so this is another poem in a way about the transmission of the far away to something closer to home. Um, because it's concerned with an act of public violence. What happens now can be transmitted, recorded so easily on cell phone, passed on. This is a great boon to us in terms of the documentation of abuse. Um, this poem is dedicated to young man Tamir Rice, 12 year old boy who was killed in Cleveland by the police. He was playing with a plastic gun in a city park. I, don't, I didn't know that boy, of course. No, I, I didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't know if I had the right to talk about it. And I began to think about what happens when a life is interrupted. How everything, every tributary that is poured into making that particular person is interrupted. And then how whatever that child might have done, whatever might have been contributed to the future is also interrupted. It's as if at the moment of his death, time implodes in a way. Future and past pushing against one another and emptying out. This is called In Two Seconds, and again, the title pours into the first line. In two seconds, the boy's face climbed back down the 12-year tunnel of its becoming, a charcoal sunflower swallowing itself. Who has eyes to hear? Who has eyes to see or ears to hear? If you could see what happens fastest, unmaking the human irreplaceable, a star falling into complete gravitational darkness from all points of itself, all this, the held loved body into which entered milk and music, honeying the cells of him, who sang to him, stroked the nap of his scalp, kissed the flesh knot after the cord completed its work of fueling into him the long history of those whose suffering was made more bearable by the as yet unknown of him, playing alone in some unthinkable future city, a Cleveland, whatever that might be. Two seconds to elapse, the arc of joy in the conception bed, the labor of hands repeated until the hands no longer required attention, so that as the woman folded, her hopes for him sank into the fabric of his shirts and underpants. Down they go, swirling down into the maw of a greater dark. Treasure books, comic box, treasure box, comic books, pocket knife, bell from a lost cat's collar. Why even begin to enumerate them when behind every tributary poured into him comes rushing backward all he hasn't been yet? Everything that boy could have thought or made, sung or theorized, built on the quavering but continuous structure that had preceded him, sank into an absence in the shape of a boy playing with a plastic gun in a city park in Ohio in the middle of the afternoon. When I say two seconds, I don't mean the time it took him to die. I mean the lapse between the instant the cruiser break to halt on the grass, between that moment and the one in which the officer fired his weapon. The two seconds taken to assess the situation. And though I believe it is a part of the work of poetry to try on at least the moment and skin of another, for this hour, I respectfully decline. I refuse it. May that officer be visited every night of his life by an enormity collapsing in front of him into an incomprehensible bloom and the voice that howls out of it. If this is no poem, but that voice, erased boy, beloved of time, who did nothing to no one and became nothing because of it, I know that voice is one of the things we call poetry. It isn't to his killer he's speaking. Poem has been left for me up here. I have to find it. Where'd it go? You know where it went? Where was it here? So, oh, you took it. Okay. Sorry. There you go. We have a little dramatic build-up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to end with a love poem. It's new. Um, called Bodega. Tulip two bunch 12 at the bodega, corner of 19th Street, January just begun, handing sign above metal tubs, sporting this panoply of shades whose curve and surface rhyme with the skin on my lover's shoulders. Two of the uncounted places on, oh, let's call them you, where my hands like to rest. 
I've studied the spectrum of possibility displayed beneath a striped rain glaze awning and made my choice. Three branches of plum decked at their tips with spherical green ideas of bloom. To purchase a bud is to buy a prospect to entertain belief. He'll be at my place in an hour just off work. The bit of future I'm carrying home is bundled in clear wrapping and jeweled with a little rain, a gift given as much to myself as to, oh, let's say you. Unwrap these and open, unexpected, early in the year, later in my life, long in coming, though sudden still, and splendid, spring. Wow, thank you, Mark. That was such a fantastic reading. Um, Mark will be here to sign books. I just want to give, well, thank you, Allison. Also, I want to make sure that I thank Allison for introducing and also for all of our introducers past and moving for in, in our future because it's so much, um, it's such an honor, but it's also a lot to really sort of wrap your head around someone that you're introducing. So thank you for that care, thoughtfulness, and for really honoring Mark in a way that I think he, he felt that. Um, we will be finishing our fall 2022 um, reading series with the faculty reading, which will happen Thursday, December 15th in two weeks. It will feature Bojan Lewis, Ander Monson, and Manuel Munoz. Um, and I just wanted to also share that we would then be returning for our spring 2023 reading series with Roberto Tejada, Cecilia Vacuna, Daniel Borzuski, Rosa Alcala, Tayem Bajas, Juan Felipe Herrera, Fareed Matuk, Nicole Seeley, Jane Hirschfeld, Michael Wasson, and Jennifer Elise Forster. So we have a really amazing spring 2023. Our, our calendar is going to come out soon. About We're running seven classes and workshops. So many of the people that, uh, many of the poets that I shared, they're all teaching classes. So check that out online and we do offer scholarships. So please remember that. Just sign up. Um, we want to make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to study with these amazing poets that we are bringing out uh, collectively. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone, for tonight. Again, for another reading. Allison, the team at Poetry Center. Gracias. Thank you.